the cost of living in the UK. The cost of living crisis means everyday life. Feels like you're being charged more every time you get to a checkout. That's because you are. Hey guys, it's Melissa and uh, today I have an interview with ITV. Last night I had an interview, a phone interview with Capital FM to talk about World Mental Health Day and today is going to be the same with ITV. They are coming to my house. I can't wait. I'm going to talk about TWE. Obviously, I'm going to talk about World Mental Health Day. If you see that dropping down, you'll have to tell me. Okay. <laughs> okay, I know who you are, but just tell me your name, first of all, um, you know, where you live and just a little bit about yourself. How would you describe yourself and just, you know, just a little bit of an intro introduction. Hi, my name is Melissa. I am 23 years old and I am very curious, very outgoing, weird, but above all, I love helping people and I just love expressing myself and mental health means a lot to me as I suffer with it myself. Okay, brilliant. I shall put my headphones on. Okay. So just give me your surname for starters as well, so I'll get that. Rose. Rose, Melissa Rose, okay. Melissa, you like to help people, especially around mental health. Why? Because I'm growing up, I, as I said, I suffer with mental health and to be able to give my experience out to other people, my uh, words and helpfulness, if you get what I mean, just to see how they would react and help them know that they're not alone. That's I love putting people in their place and saying, look, you're not alone, you can get to this place if you do it. And that's why you're YouTube. Exactly. I started to YouTube my experiences travelling, but then I thought, why not talk on camera about mental health? At the start, it was very uh, hard because I can't really talk on camera, as you can tell. But above all, the amount of comments I got back from it, I thought, oh, I'm actually really helping people here, talking about my eating disorder, how I deal with it, and how others have come to me and said, oh, I might take that away and try that. And just to be able to see that, that it's not just me out there who suffers with it. There are other people, thousands of people out there suffering with eating disorders, mental health, and we need to come together and help each other, support each other. So that's very much you doing something for yourself. Has the cost of living crisis made it even more difficult? In ways, yes, because as I said, I have friends, I travel a lot, so travelling for the cost of living, buses, trains, they have gone up. So I'm not allowed to drive as I suffer with non-epileptic seizures. So for me, the cost of living is I have to stay at home, pay the bills obviously, and then think of what am I going to do with the travelling next? So the bills come first, then the travelling, and then you've got to think about the train strikes as well. So I was coming back from Romania once and I had to get a train home from Liverpool Airport. Trains were on strike. I was stuck there. So I thought, oh, I'm stuck here now. If I pay for a taxi, it'll be over £100. So being able to have the cost of living go down a bit, it would mentally make us feel like we can get out more like we don't have to be stuck in one place because that's what help that's what makes the mental health go bad that's what it just it's like a big dark hole and it gets bigger and bigger the more time you spend in that dark hole so for you getting out and about is really important yes i i love getting out and about but around here as I had grown up, I was bullied, so I have a bit of an anxiety around here and in Wrexham. I really don't like going into Wrexham. But when I'm out of the Wrexham area, I'm a normal person. I can go around London, like, I just love it. I just love exploring new stuff, seeing new places. But around here, it's like I'm someone else. 
So getting out and about is really important for me and my mental health because I know I'm happier out there. If you're happy to, tell me about your own experience of, of mental health and um, you know your eating disorder and, and accessing help, so treatment. With my eating disorder, I've had it for 14 years now. Uh, at the start, it was brilliant, the services. CAMS were absolutely brilliant. They helped me understand what I was going through and that's why I'm so passionate about it today. But then over the years, as I've turned into an adult, that's when it started to go downhill. I used to have weekly therapy and now it's gone to once a year, which is bad on terms. Not just me, but others have had that as well. Uh, like I said, weekly therapy, it was brilliant. I couldn't have got through life without that. But to go from weekly to one a year is a huge difference. It takes a toll on your mental health and it makes you realise, is there actually help out there? Is it going to stay this way? And is it worth fighting? So that's when the depression comes in. And recently I was suffering with suicidal thoughts. So to get the help I wanted, I had to beg and beg and beg to go to and get a mental health appointment but it wasn't actually an appointment it was with duty so i've been seeing them and it's just it's it's hard to see that there's no staff there there's no staff there's when you phone up for appointment it'll be in three months it'll be in four months it's just hard to know that it's gone from really good to really bad, knowing what mental health is now and how many people suffer with it. There's no services for people. Why? That's why. And you feel you have to be in crisis before something happens? Yes. Um, I was talking to one of my friends and she has the same situation as me, depression and severe anxiety. She was suicidal and she told me uh, she was suicidal for quite a few days. She called the 111 helpline. They put her on hold. Put her on hold, put her on hold. She self-harmed. She wanted to take her own life. And at that point, she, she lives probably a hundred miles away from me. I can't go and do anything. But at that moment in time, I was ready to pack my bags and go because that was the only help that she would get. Like, to be on the break of suicide and then get attention, that's disgusting. They should be there miles and minutes before that. They should be there to provide the help that you need. And that's why I love helping people and I would love to work in mental health. To improve that, that is my dream to do that. But to be able to do that, I need to get myself better first. I can't help other people if I can't help myself. And on there, I'll just check this thing. It's all brilliant, very, very powerful, and that's all stay good. So, yeah, you can't pour from an empty cup. Exactly. And I think on the brief it said that you, you know, you've had to take your own counselling and things like that. So just I think that's really important because you know if we if we think about money, you've described how the services just aren't there when you and other people need them. What do you do then? So last year I was in a crisis. I, like I said, I was suicidal once again, and because I hadn't seen anyone for a year, I had to go private therapy which I turned to better help. They were brilliant, but it was £80 a week. But I'd done it a few sessions with them and I felt it was brilliant. The help they were giving me, wow. I've never had that help before and I felt like I was getting somewhere, but my money was going down, so I couldn't afford them anymore. So then my mental health went back up. And to see the difference between the NHS and what private therapy can do, it shouldn't be like that. The mental health system is a human right. You should be able to get the help you deserve. Like you go to the hospital, you get the help that you deserve. 
With mental health, it's not like that. You get pushed to the side. It's like you're ignored. Um, when I'd done the private therapy, like I said, it's one of the best things I ever did, but I couldn't afford it. Every week, it's, it's a lot of money to be doing that, to be able to do the stuff you love as well, bills for the house. It's physically impossible to do that. And obviously, if your mental health is poor, it's very difficult to work, is it? For me, like, I, I don't work at the minute because of my mental health and my seizures. I do work at a local school, but that's a zero-hour contract, so I'm not guaranteed any work. So uh, what I do is the volunteering. That, that's my work. That, that, that's, that's what I love doing, and that's what I put my heart into, really. Anything else you feel is important you'd like to add? I just think that mental health really needs a kick up the bum to provide more help and support out there. Let young people come in and give their advice because me doing YouTube, I've helped so many people and I love that. I, I love helping people and so many other people love helping. So let young people come in. They might not have the experience of mental health therapists, but they're good to talk to. Trust me, they are good to talk to. <laughs> Great, there we are. And just, um, do you put a name to your eating disorder? I mean, I... I have bulimia nervosa. And in terms of, you know, how that impacts a lot, your life, for people that wouldn't know, how would you describe that? My daily routine is I binge three times a day and purge. And if you don't know what binging and purging is, it's when you have a large amount of food in one sitting, you binge on it, you eat it all, and then you go to the toilet and bring it back up. Not a very nice subject to talk about, but it has to be talked about because other people out there are sitting in silence thinking they are alone. They're not. That There's so many people with bulimia nervosa and I, the way I deal with my eating disorder is if I get anxious, depressed, that's my turning point. That's my coping mechanism, my bulimia. And it shouldn't be. It should be going out and enjoying life, but it's not. My bulimia is like a second half to me. Like I can't see life without it. And it shouldn't be like that. It's hard. Thank you for describing and sharing that. It's okay. Right. It's up to you now, really, what to do. <laughs> Turn that off, have a little minute. Um, that was amazing. Thank you. Amazing. <clears throat> I think it is important. I'm really glad you said that at the end. Because I think people have got more of an understanding of anorexia. Like, exactly. people are not eating. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I don't, and just also, assume, believe, me, believe me, it's more hidden. Yeah, they just assume an eating disorder is anorexia. Yeah. It's, um, and also, I, I read somewhere, and it, it, like, most people with an eating disorder are a normal weight. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot with a normal way. Yeah, there is. Like Do you know what really I mean? They've still got an eating disorder. Yeah. But you can have a binge eating disorder and you can be overweight, but it's still classed as a meat. Yeah, it? yeah, true. It's, yeah, comfort eating. Sort exactly. Of thing. Right then, what I'm going to do is, you've talked a lot about YouTube. I think it would be great for you to do a bit. Do whatever you want. I don't know. So that would be you setting up your camera. Where would you normally do that? Thing, Edward.